The other function of the shot caller, of course, is to order the hits, the stabbings or the killings of other inmates. From day one of living with Jimmy, he told me, look, I know you're not a gangster. I can see you're a good kid. You're a smart kid. And I want you to walk out of this place. But there's no free rides and you're going to need to put in some work. I know you're not a killer, but you're going to have to pay your way. And I said, all right. So I kind of became Jimmy's errand boy, I guess you could say. I would collect a lot of the drug debts that were owed. I would bring a lot of balloons back from the kitchen where he got me a job. Sometimes I would take balloons from the cell block when they arrived and took them to the kitchen where I would give them to a different inmate, also part of the Hells Angels, but who was on a different yard. And Jimmy loved using me to pass balloons because I wasn't gang affiliated. So that means I was getting searched less, which I, of course, had no problem with because search means strip searched. And we all know that's when you get naked and you spread your ass and you cough for this fucking guard. I was just under the radar. I was not somebody that they suspected. Therefore, I was kind of the perfect drug mule. How would I smuggle the balloons? Well, you'd probably guess I shove them up my ass. That's the main way that prison drugs get smuggled. Uh, we call them keistering in there. I don't know why they use 1950s terminology, but they're still saying that. So you shove a balloon up your keister. Sometimes you smuggle a prison shank that way too. That seems incredibly painful. I never had to do that, but I would you know, stick a balloon uh, up my ass. I would always have the, the end of the balloon, the little rubbery part, sticking out kind of like a tampon. So I knew that it wouldn't get stuck in there and I would have to go to the emergency room uh, and be humiliated plus go to the hole. So I would, you know, keister a balloon every couple of weeks. If I knew I was working in the prison kitchen, Jimmy would give me a balloon and he would say, okay, you're going to drop it off to this guy. I would go do my shift in the kitchen where I worked as like a sous chef actually uh, and then I would go to the bathroom. I would take the balloon out and I would, you know, pass it off to whoever was receiving the package that day. And prison debt collection was, you know, I'm not going to get into the specifics, but, you know, I had to lean on a few people who were junkies and that owed Jimmy money. So, you know, that's you rough a guy up, you, you know, maybe threaten him, whatever it was. Uh, I never had to step on anybody too hard because they knew that Jimmy's word you know, was his word. And that meant death ultimately, if you weren't going to pay, but uh, I would take people's payments. The prison drug economy operates in a variety of ways. A lot of it involves bartering, but the cleanest way to sell somebody drugs and receive payment from them when you're both locked up is kind of like this. So say I want to sell you a gram of meth in prison and that costs whatever, 300 bucks, let's say. I would have somebody on the outside meet somebody that you knew on the outside and you guys would exchange the money that way. So Jimmy would be on his cell phone talking to one of his soldiers on the streets who was collecting money from the loved one of whoever he was selling drugs to in prison. And when he got the word that they had the cash, he would then take the balloon and give that inmate the drugs. Does that make sense? Now that's the cleanest way. Obviously, bartering is a huge one. So if you don't have anybody in the outside who's able to bring whatever person the drug dealers have on the outside, physical cash, you can pay for it in canteen or commissary. So a bag of coffee, for example, is worth about $7. So if I wanted to go smoke weed, I might go to one of the black guys who had it and I would say, hey, I'll trade you a bag of coffee for a stick of weed, right? So the same was true with the way that Jimmy dealt methamphetamine. And if somebody owed 200 bucks, I might be taking their entire canteen bags for the next month. So our cell was packed with junk food. We had Doritos for days, cup of noodle, cigarettes, coffee. It was like being in a snack bar. And these drug debts are by far the most common reason that prison shankings happen. And just like the mob on the outside, in prison, you can't stab or touch anybody, especially not a made guy, without getting the blessing from the shot caller first. And Jimmy took this very seriously. He was all about respect, and he did not allow anybody to act without his blessings first. And that was because he comes from a Sicilian background. And as I said earlier, he came up working for the Cosa Nostra, and he ran his outfit much the same way. 
Guys, if you like that video, make sure to check out the full episode right here and subscribe to the channel right here.